Hello everyone and welcome to my favorite part of whole railway system railway track. In this video you will see some very interesting things about railway track that you didn't know and learn some real essentials that every rail engineer should know. So let's start with what railway track is. So railway track is actually a structure that consists of rails, sleepers, fastening system, ballast and not necessarily it can be slab track and substructure or subgrade. So how we can define use of railway tracks. I'm sure you never, hold, you never heard all these reasons together. Some people might argue that I exaggerate a little and that's okay, they're probably right. So first of all, they enable trains to run on it. Second, they ensure that trains will stay on them by having standardized distance between rails, also called track gauge. Third, they distribute loads from train to the ground through wheel rail connection. Fourth, they allow trains to run at higher speeds in curves by elevating outer rail. Fifth, they allow trains to brake by using electromagnetic brake rail contact. Sixth, they help track circuits to identify train absence by enabling currents to flow. Seventh, they absorb noise from passing trains. Eighth, they allow trains grounding or earthing. And last, they allow us track designers to create our imagination on many different ways. So let me know down below in comments if you knew all these ways of railway track usage. So now when we define the importance of railway tracks, let's classify them. We have ballasted railway tracks and slab tracks or ballastless tracks. There are some subgroups, but these are main two groups in the world. Most common track that you all probably know is ballasted track. Ballasted track consists of rails, fastening system with rail pads, sleepers, ballast, eventually sub-ballast and sub-grade. Rails can be in different shapes and forms depending on their use, but they are usually classified by shape and weight. In other words, how much weight is in one meter of rail, for example, six kilo, 60 kilos. Rails are fastened to a sleepers by fastening system, but they usually do not lie on sleepers but the rail under pad. Super interesting thing is that both rails are inclined towards center of the track. Fastening system is used to connect rails and fasten them to sleepers. There are many varieties of fastening systems and many of them have different characteristics such as elasticity, stiffness, etc. Elastic fastening system allows rails and sleepers micro adjustments during their train passing, but also in different weather conditions. Some brands that are widely used are Pandrol and Voslo. Railway sleepers are positioned and lying below rails and fastening system. Their function is to keep rails in a proper distance one to each other, to distribute loads from rails down to subgrade, to keep rails together with fastening system upright, but they also play a main role in track stability as they are positioned in ballast. They can be made out of the wood, steel, concrete and even some composite plastic materials. Interesting thing is that wooden sleepers go through a process of so-called impregnation before lying to the ground, which is actually a protection layer that helps them to last longer. Together with sleepers, we have a bunch of these rocks that you all have probably seen before. These rocks are compiled together and they're called ballast. Railway sleepers and ballast create so-called truck bed. Railway ballast does not need necessarily to be rocks. It can be made of some other materials such as gravel, slag, even sand. However, if you want to have high quality ballast, you have to have these crushed rocks of irregular shape and proper size. Why is that important is because ballast plays main role in track stability, bearing the loads down the structure, enabling good drainage and stopping vegetation as well, which can have negative effects on the track in the long term. Beneath ballast, we have one layer called sub-ballast. Difference between ballast and sub-ballast is in layer thickness, but also in rock size. His main role is to act as some form of filter and drainage layer. Last layer is called subgrade and it is actually well prepared solid ground area to compensate for unevenness and support upper elements of the track. Below subgrade is the ground. There are some side parts that are also considered as a part of the track such as drainage channels, embankments and slopes, but I will not go deep on these. Now, you know how cross section of the track looks like and its main part. Let's pretend now that we are birds now and have a look how the track looks like along the railway from top view. Before we go into track elements along the way, let's, let's distinguish two different types of the track based on connection between rails. So we have jointed track, which are actually two rails connected one to each other by so-called fish plates, which are bolted in both rails. If you ever heard this voice while in train, know that you have probably passed the joint point. 
There are sometimes small gaps left between them as rails can expand, especially during the summer. They are still used in many countries, but they have some major disadvantages such as rail head cracking, discomfort while traveling, etc. Also, one additional thing that some people don't know is that they cannot be used on trains with electromagnetic brakes as they could cause disasters and fatalities. So in order to prevent all of this, we have continuously welded track where rails ends are welded one to each other so they can be long even few kilometers. This connection is actually much better as it allows smoothness, less maintenance and better track stability, but it's actually more costly to, to implement. So back to the bird's eye. Railway track consists of two main parts in general, main line and turnouts or switches. Why I divide them uh, like this is because turnouts are usually prefabricated and brought to a place. Now both main line and turnouts have some specific elements and not all necessarily. These elements are straight track, transition curve and curve. Straight track is simple as it says, place where track is straight. And one digression here, it doesn't mean that train travels straight also, as train have micro sinusoidal movements, but it is out of the scope of this video really. Transition curve is an element of the track between straight track and curve, but please note, not necessarily as we have so-called S-curves where transition curves meet one each other in the other direction. Transition curve is used to allow smooth transition between straight part and the curve because you don't want to go directly from straight track to curve as you can have these sidekicks. This is especially important for small radius and also when speeds are high. Last element is curve and it is simple as its name says. Uh, or not. Well, it depends, but we have to introduce something called track super elevation here, which is actually elevating of outer rail to compensate lateral forces. And if you want to know more about this, check this video on my channel. There are many different and interesting ways how these elements interact with each other and how you design the track with them. As this is the core of the system. So if you want to learn how to design the tracks, go and check my track design course where you can learn all of this and become real engineer in just 30 days. And note that if there is no available spots, just subscribe to waitlist. So other super fun thing, turnouts or switches, crossings, points, many names, right? Railway turnout is a place or installation that allows trains to cross from one track to another. There are many different types of turnouts, single slip, double slip, crossover, three-way switch, etc. A lot of different types really, depending on design speed, uh, number of tracks connecting, etc. However, when you are track designer, you have to worry about one more thing beside all these mentioned. And that is if turnout is straight or curved. And this is designers face when they realize that there is no other way but to deal with curved turnout. Really, they are not desirable and sometimes when designing them it feels like catch-22. However, sometimes you just have to have them. So this projection of the track is called track plan. Beside that, we also have track profile and that is actually profile that defines train movements upwards and downwards. It consists of straight lines and vertical curves which could be convex and concave. Beside all these mentioned elements, we have also some other objects that are part of the track. Combining few tracks together on one spot is usually called a station, where many trains interact. If there, if there is extremely large number of tracks with many freight cars, it is called marshalling yard. In the stations, there are also some side tracks that are used for parking trains. At the end, they have so-called buffer stops, which are used to stop the train on one side. Besides buffer stops, we also have derailers, which are installations positioned on the track to derail cars if they unintentionally start moving all to, to protect the main tracks. There are some other objects such as railway expansion devices, rail guards and similar, but I would really not discuss them in detail. Beside ballasted track, which I explained, we have also slab track or ballastless track. As its name says, there is no ballast in this track. Instead, continuous concrete is used with resilience pads and rails on it. There are many variations, but this is how it looks in its basic form. And why slab track? Well, ballasted track has some disadvantages, such as slow deterioration of materials due to traffic loading and high weight and a lot of material. Therefore, high maintenance is needed. On the other side, slab track is lower in weight. It has lower maintenance, lower structure height. The main problem with it is actually that it has high initial costs at the beginning and more important, if switching from ballasted to slab track, complete track closure is needed. 
However, it is getting more and more popular, especially for high-speed railways. I'm not sure if this is the future of railway track design, but my honest opinion is that it is actually a better solution. Okay, we are almost at the end and I just want to mention a few other concepts as well. As you all probably know, there are some other kinds of trains such as magnetic levitation trains and in simplest form they use slab track with the fact that they levitate uh, like above the track and have some additional components compared to classic railway tracks. And beside that, there is also this new concept of Hyperloop. The idea that I really support, which is actually upgrade to a magnetic levitation. In that case, we can have some extra track components such as these vacuum tubes, for example. However, I'm not even sure if Hyperloop is considered as modern railway, as some people uh, call it new mode of transportation, but I will leave that discussion to you. Thank you very much for watching my video. My idea is really to share railway knowledge and develop a community of people interested in this industry. So if you find this valuable in the term of appreciation, please like the video, share it and subscribe to my channel. Thank you very much and see you soon. Bye.